Morning, everybody, and welcome here to the Robgen Pine Town. And I'm very, very happy to be here this morning because I get excited when I talk about Jesus. I just love talking about Jesus because Jesus is the center of everything. Yeah, you know, we take ourselves out of the whole picture and we put him into the picture. And the words that he says, and sometimes we think, you know what, uh, Jesus is going to tell us something and, and we're really going to sit and we're going to listen, we're going to love it. But sometimes he tells us something that scares us. Sometimes he'll say, sometimes he'll drop a bomb in the middle of a story that he's, that, that he, that he's talking about. I want to talk this morning about one of his parables. We call them parables. Um, it's a narrative by Jesus, and it's called The Great Banquet. It's a story about a, a nobleman who sends out for a great banquet. But before we start that, I just want to express a few things, and, and things that we will actually have to understand, that Jesus was a Jew. His disciples were Jews. His followers were Jews. The people he was talking to around Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and throughout the Galilee were mainly Jews, and he had a big Jewish following. Now, there was a lot of rabbis. Jesus was a rabbi. They called him an itinerant rabbi because he didn't belong to any particular synagogue. There were other rabbis who were like him, moved around. There were rabbis who belonged to synagogues, and all of those rabbis, they also taught parables. So Jesus wasn't unique in that. This was just something that happened in that day where the people could learn, and they learned from the Torah. They learned from the old, what we would call the Old Testament. They called it the Hebrew Scriptures. It consisted of, of the, the first five books, which was Torah. Then it consisted of the the, the, the writings like Solomon and Ruth and Daniel, and then it went on to be to speak about the prophets, the prophets like uh, Micah, the smaller prophets, the minor prophets, Micah, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, uh, these, these great men. And they learned about these men, and they, they understood. So the people he was talking to were well-versed, and they were well came up, and they knew exactly what he was talking about. Now, the, the, the Torah, it's the written word of God. It was put down on scrolls, and when they used to read from those scrolls, they'd bring them into the synagogue on the Sabbath day, on the Shabbat, Bring them in, and they would put, uh, they would, they would read from those scrolls, and and the literal word from the scrolls was actually, it, 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 they read every literal word that came out. It was called halakha. Halakha was the word, and it, it it just went on and on and on. Now, what the rabbis did and the teachers, they would take the the, the halakha, which was the written word. And they would then, to make it more easier for, for the people to understand, they would then tell it in story form, which would be called Haggadah. Haggadah was more in, uh, like a commentary that would, they, that would explain. And this is what Jesus does when he talks about the great banquet. He talks about, he gives them a Haggadah about what it means, about what this particular view. Now, you, you've got different views. And over the years, because don't forget, Jesus was crucified 2,000 years ago. So th things have changed, and people have changed. And because we're not, in the, we're not in the Eastern, we weren't brought up in the Middle Eastern culture, but we have to learn the Middle Eastern culture to understand clearly and get more visible, to, be under, to get the full understanding of, of, what, of what it contains and what it's trying to get out. Now, we've got different things. I'll give you an example. And back in the day, uh, back in the day of Jesus, when the rabbis were talking, they would talk about. Uh, I'll give you an example of uh, a fat man riding a donkey, and the fat man was saying, "Wow, I wish I could get off this donkey, because it's so uncomfortable." And the donkey was thinking, "Wow, I wonder when this fat man's going to get off me, because he is so heavy." So here we have the same story, but two different views. And that's what we get with parables. We get different views. In the, West, uh, in the Western world where we, where we live, um, we tend to sometimes categorize what these views are. and what, what we, we almost sort of put a view of what um, we want to get across. Close the door. We want to close the door. We don't want anybody here in again. <laughs> We've got a huge race going outside, so therefore there's going to be a lot of noise. 
Um, so the stories, and, and, and we take, I'll just take a simple story and show you how we can allegorize it and how sometimes it makes, doesn't make a lot of sense. The Good Samaritans. We have symbols for everything. A professor was explaining to his class the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan, he says, was Jesus, like filled with the Holy Spirit, who came upon a beaten and robbed man who was actually a sinner. And, and he was a type of sinner. Then who went past him when he was lying half dead on the side of the road was a priest and a Levi who were religious people of that day. So we've got Jesus here, we've got the sinner, and we've got the road that was leading to, to, to treachery, to death, and he was beaten up, and those who passed him by were the religious people at that particular time. So someone at the back said, raised their hand and they said, oh, then he was taken to an inn. And the inn was indeed uh, classified as the church. Wow, you can come into the church and you'll be healed and you'll, you know. And for those of us who have been going to church on a regular basis, we know that the church can sometimes be like a hospital. Who do you put in hospital? Sick people. Who do you put in, in, in churches? People who need Jesus. And that's why I'm here, because I know I definitely need Jesus. So that... Professor was telling this, and he, he had uh, allegorized all of these little little people, and, and spoke about the who who was what, and who was there, and who was there. And a little hand at the back went up and says, "Excuse me, professor, who was the donkey that that he put him on?" And the professor thought about it, and he thought, "You know what?" He says, "I was the jackass." He says, because I shouldn't have allegorized it and told you those stories. So with this story that we're going to talk about now. We're going to read, um, it, it's, it's the banquet, and we're going to let it rest. We're going to let it speak for itself. I'm going to say a few things, but we're going to let it speak for itself. And it starts off, we, you have to pick it up, run about chapter, uh, Luke chapter 14, verse 1, when Jesus was actually invited to a Pharisee's home. The Pharisee was a great nobleman, and while he was uh, about there, um, he saw someone, this was on the Sabbath day, which is the Jewish holy day. It was a day of covenant. In fact, because God says we will give you a covenant to remember this day, to this period, and it was a Sabbath. And they weren't allowed to do any work. They weren't allowed to do any movement. But Jesus saw this man with an irregular swelling in his body. And he said to him, be healed. And the man was healed. There was a lot of talk. There was a lot of look around the room. There was a lot of thinking about, no, we, we you know, uh, not supposed to do this on the Sabbath. And Jesus came along and he did it anyway. And as he approached the table, now this bank, this was a banquet. This was huge, like, like a huge wedding reception, but it was a huge banquet. And as he was sitting down, he looked around the banquet and he saw banquet and he saw the places of honor where people would be sitting. You know, you have, you know the way you do when you go to a wedding, you've got the bride and groom at one table, then you've got their parents, and then you've got the, the bride's parents, and then the, the, the other parents, then you've got the aunties and the uncles, and then all the way down until you've got people who are just supposed to bring presents. Well, you know what I mean. Anyway, that, that's, he looked at that and he, he, he saw this. And, and when he saw this and they looked and they wondered, why on earth is this guy healing people on the Sabbath? And Jesus said to them, you know what? If your child needed help on the Sabbath day, or if you had a farm animal or an oxen that had fallen into a hole, would you not help it or would you just leave it? And the answer was, of course, they would help it. So as he sat down at the table, he was about to sit down and he saw all these people who were put in their own little places at the table. And I want to read you Luke chapter 14, verse 15 through to 24. And if you can just bear with me, and I will read this one to you. Luke chapter 14, verse 15 when one of the, of the at the table with him, now he's at the table, heard what he had said about healing, he said to Jesus, blessed is the man who will eat at the feast of the kingdom of God. Isn't that so true, eh? Jesus replied, a certain man was preparing a great banquet. Now, he's coming to tell the story. This was Jesus' opening. 
Sometimes Jesus spoke. Sometimes he didn't. When he was being persecuted, he was as silent as a lamb. But then when he spoke, he spoke, and he spoke words of wisdom. He replied, a certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. And at that time of the banquet, he sent his servant. So it must have been someone who was very wealthy, had servants, and he had a huge house and plenty of room and plenty of food for the whole thing. He said, the servant, he said, they let those who to be invited, come for everything now is ready. Those who have invited, they must come now for everything is ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. Now, Jesus gives three types. The first said, I have just bought a field and I must go and see it. Buying a field would be to buy a field, maybe to build a house on it, um, maybe to look after the field. Please excuse me. Another said, I've just bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Well, buying five oxen to try them out would have been a good reason for not to come, because you want to try them. It's like buying a car. I've just bought a car. I would really like to go and try this car. I want to do this. Still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. I believe that's the best answer to them all. I've just got married, and my wife won't let me come or I've just got married, and, 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 and I'm on my honeymoon. Yeah, I thought that was a pretty good one. Anyway, whatever, whatever these are, these are three, three situations that, 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 that happened. These are the excuses. The servants came back and reported this to the master. And then the owner of the house, he became angry because he had invited these people. He knew these people. He had invited them personally. Then he ordered his servant, go out quickly into the streets and the alleys of the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant said, this was after a while, after he had brought them all in, what you ordered has been done, but there is still room. Then the master uh, said to his servant, then go to the roads and the country lanes, and the highways, and the byways, and all the little seedy places you can find, and bring in and fill my house up. I tell you, not one of those men who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. Now, here's an interesting thing. The first three men, the first three examples, all ha seem to have legitimate excuses. Really, they, you know, I bought a field. Uh, maybe I want to buy a house in it. I'm busy. Um, they seem to be fair excuses. So Jesus uses, he uses a legitimate excuses of what they were doing. And what were they doing? They were living life. They were just living normal life. I've just bought a field. I've just bought like some cows. And, uh, uh, or I've just bought a car. I've just bought this. And I, I need to try it out. I've just bought a little van for my business. I, I've just, I, this is the sort of thing. I've just got married. I've got to go on my honeymoon. My wife doesn't want me to be here with, with, with you guys. I've, I've, I've really got to go. They, Jesus didn't choose some silly excuses like, oh, I can't come because I need to wash my hair. That sort of thing. He, or I've got to do my nails. He used good excuses. And Jesus' excuses were legitimate. Looking after a new place to live, taking a new, a care of your new position, whether it be oxen or a motor car. But looking after your wife was really a good excuse. That was very important. So he picked those three examples. So when Jesus calls us, he calls us in the middle of our world. In other words, he calls us in the middle of our daily stuff that we're doing. It doesn't have to be, and we often hear this, where, where people say, oh, well, I was so sick and I called upon the Lord, and that's how I came to know the Lord. Uh, or I've got had no money and I, I had to I called upon the Lord and He saw me through. That's great, but these were three guys living in normal life and God called them to to, to come. The, the banquet is there. Please, now is the time to come. We sang a song this morning. Come now is the time to worship. You know when we leave here in an hour or so time. And now is not the time to worship here, but we can worship somewhere else. But come, now is the time to worship. 
God calls them in the middle of their world, in the middle of their everyday life. They were living. And that's how God found most of us. I know when he found me, I was in the Royal Navy. I was 19 years old. I didn't have uh, anything to worry about. I didn't have any wives. I didn't have any children. I was doing okay. And all of a sudden, I got this call, and I thought, uh, is, it, is it a call from God, or isn't it a call from I, I don't know, because I wasn't a goody two-shoes. I just didn't really know, but I felt in my heart there was something there that, that, that hey, you know, I, I really felt it. And, and that's how I was, I, was, I, was, I, I came to know the Lord, and I'm sure many people came to know the Lord like that. And that's how God found me and found most of us. And those who got invited to this uh, 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 sort of dinner, people were living and perhaps living it up, maybe living well. But in this particular story, they are engrossed in their own lives. You come to this, you've been invited, you knew about it beforehand, you've been invited, but now... You're engrossed in your own life. So much so that they don't even have time to go to this huge dinner. So the master of the house gets very angry, but this is a good part. He changes his anger from wanting to have sort of, a, to, to get against these people, to, 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 to be angry with them, to get retribution against them. He changed it. And instead, his anger, he turned to his servant and, his, and he changed his message and he tells his servant, okay, well, go to the streets and go to the alleyways. If the people who we invited, they don't want to know, then go to the streets, go to the alleyways, and go, and go to there and go and find the poor and go and find the blind, go and find the lame, go and find the cripple, go and find the one with the fractured shoulder. I just thought I'd put that one in. Okay, go and do, all, do, go and do this and bring them in. Now, that, that, that's interesting. Um, that's in verse 21. The blind, the crippled, the lame, the poor. When we have, in the Western world today, we have got many churches, and, and unfortunately, we have many denominations as well. Um, and that a lot of the denominations, their constitutions are, are man-made. And you, during the days of Jesus, funnily enough, a, a similar thing happened amongst the Jews. There weren't just Jews. There were Jews who run the, the sect of the Pharisees. There was Jews who run the sect of the Sadducees. There was Jews who run the sect of the Zealots. There was Jews who run the sect of a group called the Essenes. The group of the Essenes, they were the ones who went down by the Dead Sea. They, they wanted to keep themselves pure. In fact, the Dead Sea Scrolls was written by this type of people down in the Qumran Caves. And that's where we get a lot of the, of the works of the Old Testament from them because they kept them religiously and they stored them away. But they would not let to join their little congregation they would not let the poor, they would not let the blind, they would not let the lame, they wouldn't let the cripples join their congregation because they wanted to keep their congregation pure. They didn't want any impurities among it. And here we see Jesus, now remember it's Jesus telling the story, it's not the master of this feast. Jesus is saying that the master of the feast is saying, go and bring these in, totally against what the Essene people thought. But Jesus said, this was the thing, this Jewish, so this Jewish group he was talking about, and when I started, I told you they were all Jews, they would have understood exactly what he was talking about. They would have understood that completely. And where these Essenes would have got that would have been from Leviticus, where the priests, the, 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 the Hebrew priests, were not allowed to be lame or to be crippled or to be poor. They had to be of, 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 a, of a pure uh, background, and they had to be pure at heart. And so that's where they got that from. But Jesus said, no. And then he said, but those who were excluded ones included the story Jesus is telling, and the people he was telling it to would have to understand what he was talking about, and they did. 
but there's more to come because Jesus didn't stop talking. See, and at this point, some Christians and some Christians in the West, and we look and what we say is, okay, well, I'll tell you what that means. That means you've got the, the, the invitation to the Israel to come and join, believe in Jesus and join in the covenant. And they didn't, they rejected it. So God then went to the Gentiles and they will take it. It didn't mean that, not so ever. So after the party, and the party got on, and you see after they got all of the lame, the blind, the cripples, and the poor, they were all there. And the servant came back in verse 22 and said, do you know what? We have got more room at the table. We still can't fill it up. Now, why would that be? Why would there be more room? Remember what Jesus said, there are in my father's house, there are many mansions. If that were not so, I would have told you. There was more room. So Jesus told us, there's an abundance of space. So the master said, I want you now to go to the lanes and all the little seedy places and invite all you can. In fact, go to the traffic lights, go to the places where, where people don't, you know, you wouldn't want them to come to your party. You go to all those places. And they said, well, what qualification should these people have? What, would it be their good works or their good standing? And should they have um, acquired something good in the community? And the answer was no. All you have to do is ask them to come in. And if they come, if they come with you, you bring them in. Just bring them in. Just let them come. Jesus had put the net out wider. He had put it out wider. The master invited the certain people that he wanted to be there. He then put it out to the people who were the lame, the poor, the cripples. And then he put it out to the people right outside in the alleyways, maybe lying in ditches, people who maybe you and I wouldn't be comfortable with coming to any of our, par uh, our parties or whatever. You know, when we, when, when we get like that, um, because we know, some, we know some folk who we think don't deserve to be invited. And we do. We all, we've, we've all got somebody who we think, yeah, I hope he gets his comeuppance. You know, you just have to watch your TV programs and you say, ooh, I hope this guy gets his comeuppance here. We know, how, we know how they talk. We know how these guys think. We know how they live. We, we've seen people living around us, and they don't, they don't deserve it. Are you sure you want them to come to your party? If we go out and get everyone, the lame, the blind, the cripples, the poor, and maybe the only ones left are the God-haters who would probably prefer to put a bomb in the party than actually join, join in the party and enjoy it. But do you know how hard that is to invite people to a party that you don't like? You ever had to invite someone to a party you don't like? I do know some weddings where the bride and the groom, and we have got to invite auntie so-and-so, otherwise the auntie so-and-so on the other side will be upset about the whole thing, and therefore we've, we've, we've got to bring them in. But now we're talking about people who are maybe even shooting drugs and doing drugs, and Jesus is saying, give them the invitation and see if they will answer to that. Then Jesus carries on talking in verse 24, and this is the bombshell that really comes in. And he says, I tell you that not one of those who were invited initially will not get to taste of it. What? What? Get a taste of what? The, the, the feast? Someone asked him earlier about the kingdom of God. They'll not get to taste the kingdom of God those who got the invitation earlier. Wow. So how do we get into the kingdom of God? He just said it's not by invitation only. So what do we do? How do we, how do we get into it? So as I said earlier, people have made it a Jew and Gentile thing. Israel was invited to the party in, in, in the covenant with God, rejected it. Then he sent out for all the rest, all of us. So the only way in for Israel is to be like us. That is what some preachers preach, and that's wrong. Do you know, 
thinking like that is the grossest form of anti-Semitism. That kind that exists under the guise of Christianity. When you see the Christians against that, and when you see the Christian people coming out with anti-Semitism, you know that that's not right, that it's from the evil one. It's the grossest kind of anti-Semitism is Christianity when they, ref when they exclude the Jews. In fact, this is the grossest form of anything when you attach Christ that excludes people from coming in to the kingdom of God. But Jesus hasn't finished talking. And Jesus gives us an explanation that works. And the reason it works is because it scares us. He comes up with a two-edged sword, and that's what the truth is. The truth is a two-edged sword that divides us. Some who got invited, but they were too busy buying their homes and their oxen and their cars and their getting unmarried. Is that wrong? No. The next lot he gets, he invites next, is the ones who had nothing, nothing. And they came along. But the third lot that came along are the people who didn't even know that the banquet existed. And they came along to the party. He says, and be sure to tell everybody who you speak to that they can't get in with the original invitation card. You can't get in with the original invitation card. The solemn warning is clear. While the great invitation, now we're talking about the great invitation to the kingdom of heaven, is open to all, the invited guests stand in mortal danger of missing a never-to-be-repeated opportunity. We can talk to people, people that you know, people who are in your family, people in your friends, people who you met. You can actually talk to them about the kingdom of God. You can invite them by your speech, and I don't mean literally you can say to them, come into the kingdom of God, but you can do that spark. You know, you plant the seed, someone else will water it, and it's God that does the growth. That's the thing. You plant that seed there, and the solemn warning is for those who get that invitation, stand in mortal danger of missing a never to be repeated opportunity again. Why? Because the timing is everything. And the time for you, whether you're here, whether you're watching it on YouTube, the time for you that hears these words is right now. God bless you, and thank you all for watching today.